This hiker was 4.6 miles from the trailhead. The rescue teams were able to take the snowmobiles 2.6 miles up Livermore Road, where they came to the junction um, of basically an unbroken trail with knee-deep snow, and that was another 2.3 miles to get to the victim. Broadcasting from the Woodpecker Studio in the great state of New Hampshire, welcome to Episode 3 of the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast, where we discuss all things related to hiking and search and rescue in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. This week, we are continuing our Intro to New Hampshire Hiking series with a discussion about the 52 with a view list and peak bagging in the White Mountains. Looking for a little more solitude and a little less altitude and a lot of pretty views in your hiking adventures? We will break the 52 with a view list down for you. Our second topic will cover a recent controversy that erupted in the New Hampshire hiking community around the term redlining, resulting in a lot of drama. Later in our show, we will discuss a recent rescue that occurred on the south peak of the Tri-Pyramids. I'm Mike. And I'm Stomp. Let's get started. What are you drinking tonight, my friend? So, show tradition. We start with the hydration discussion, right? <laughs> so, um, that's right. I've got a new one here from Mayflower Brewing. And it's called, um, I actually picked this up tonight because I, I was interested in the name. It's called Love in Wrestling. So I'm a big pro wrestling nerd. So although not not new pro wrestling, but back in the 80s and all that. So I picked it up. It's pretty good. Can't complain. Nice. What do you, you always outdo me in this area yeah, here. Yeah, let me guess you're drinking some fancy wine, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's not so fancy, actually. It's out of a box. Don't tell anybody. Oh, yeah, well. It's a Bota. B-O-T-A. Bota. Oh, my mother-in-law would it's be... It's a Pinot yeah, Grigio. My mother-in-law would be proud of you. She loves the wine out of the box, so... <laughs> um, have you uh, you done any hiking recently? Uh, last night, I went up to the Dickey Ledges, actually, So with my wife last night. Oh. It was a really nice time. Very cool. Very cool. So, a little, little yeah, backyard hike for you. Beautiful up there. The snow's melting fast. Um, the slushy stuff is starting to melt, and starting to reveal that icy layer underneath so not time to get rid of the spikes yet very nice this is the part where you're supposed to ask me if i've done any hiking asshole <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think we'll just keep that that's pretty funny yeah, yeah you should any recent hikes you've done stop yeah, yeah, just uh, the other day, my wife and I went up to the ledges of Dickey Mountain. It's always beautiful. It's about a mile and a half up. This was probably mid-afternoon, late afternoon, and uh, plenty of sun. Spring's coming. Ice is melting. Yeah, how about you? I did, actually. I Oddly enough, we're doing a story about a rescue on the Tri-Pyramids. I was on the Tri-Pyramids last weekend, um, got out of my comfort zone a little bit. I, was, I had a day off of work on a Friday, and... I wanted to do the tri pyramids just because I was I'm working on the winter four thousand footer list, but it was it's a long hike and I didn't want to go on a Friday by myself. So actually hooked up with a kid in this this group called the New Hampshire Hiking Buddies. They they basically are like sort of a meetup group that you can join on uh, Facebook. And uh, this kid George, nice guy. Uh, met him in the parking lot. We just arranged to to meet. He's like a 22 year old kid. He's like a quarter of the way through his grid. He's like a, a hiking monk. Mm -hmm. He he basically just hikes every Friday and Saturday. So we went up Sabaday Brook, and then we came down Pine Bend. So we did Middle Tri Pyramid and uh, North Tri Pyramid. So it was nice. Mm. We didn't see anybody else the whole day, so it was just us. Okay, that's where the um, the fool killer is. When you come straight up to Middle Tri Pyramid, that's a yes. nice bushwhack we should talk about sometime. Yeah, yeah, we will. We, we, as a matter of fact, we were talking about that when we were hiking. The Fool Killer and uh, Kate Sleeper. So, oh man, yeah, beautiful stuff. Probably talk about that a little bit when we, we talk about the rescue that just happened up there anyway. So, but it was kind of cool. I was up there on a Friday and then there was a rescue on a Saturday. So, mm -hmm. I must have brought the, brought the danger with me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We right, want to get into our first uh, segment here. So, you want to kick us off, Stomp? Yes, sir. Now, we're going to continue with our series we are calling Intro to New Hampshire Hiking. This is a series of episodes where we will cover a lot of basic info that hikers in the whites learn as they pursue hiking goals. Last week, we talked about the 4,000-footer list, a list of 48 mountains that are considered the most difficult hikes in the whites. This week, 
we review the 52 with a view list, a complimentary list that is typically pursued by people who have generally completed the 48 4,000 footers or those who look to hike slightly easier mountains with guaranteed views. I've been hiking the 52 with a view list pretty pretty much exclusively for the last year, year and a half because I, I finished up the 48 4,000 footers, or I have one left, but I basically decided to just hold off on doing that final 4,000 footer and then focus on the 52 with a view list. And and honestly, Mm -hmm. my opinion after doing the majority of these hikes, I actually prefer the 52 with a view list over the 4,000 footers. So a little little controversy there, but I, I prefer them. And we'll get into a little bit why that is, but I think just to kick us off a little bit, to give give people background, uh, we've talked about how in the Northeast we we like to gamify our hiking activities. So this particular list was created again, sort of with the same idea that you know, you want to spread out the the hikes that people are doing. You don't want everybody clustered onto a couple of different areas. So the fifty two with the view list sort of takes that idea of the four thousand footers and spreads you out across all of New Hampshire. Uh, but it's a little bit different where none of the peaks are over four thousand feet and they are varying amount of views, but they're typically really nice. Uh, and as of all of these lists that we talk about, there's a governing body that oversees them. So the the group that oversees this list is called the Over the Hill Hikers group, which I think we're almost getting to that age stomp where we might qualify to be members soon. Tisk, tisk, tisk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, just to just to give a quick overview, so the the Over the Hill Hikers began in the summer of 1979 with a handful of friends hiking uh, in the Sandwich, New Hampshire area. And the leader of this group was a lady by the name of Lib Bates, and she was known as the Den Mother. And my understanding, and there's, you know, and we'll talk about Ken McGray's book about this, uh, but my understanding is that basically this was a group of retirees, so, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old, and they got into hiking in the late 70s. They did the 4,000 footer list, and then Lib Bates, apparently, like, I think her father was like very involved in the AMC. He might have been one of the original hut masters. So this, this lady had been hiking all over New Hampshire, and um, she basically decided to take the idea of the 4,000 footer list and identify smaller mountains because this group was a little bit older and some of the folks didn't want to go hike 4,000 footers as much. So she basically came up with this list of 52 additional peaks. And the idea is that if you you complete the 48 4,000 footers and then you do the 52 with the views, it's 100 peaks total that you'll hike across New Hampshire. Mm. I guess the club was pretty active in like the 80s and into the 90s. And the list that they have has changed a little bit over the years. I think there's like five or six peaks that are no longer on the list because trees grow and views start to get um, affected. Yeah. From my research, there were two that are delisted. Mount Carr and one other one, I believe. Well, there's Mount Wolf. There's about seven, actually. That have oh, been yeah, de- Mount Wolf. Yeah, there's about seven that have been delisted uh, because there was two or three that were delisted, like, I don't know, like maybe 10, 15 years ago. And then they delisted mm-hmm. like four or five uh, last year. Interesting. And I was kind of in the middle of hiking them, and I had, I had uh, I think, done one of those. But uh, what a lot of people... Well, a lot of people will do is they'll just, they'll say, I'm going to hike all 57 or 59, however many there are. Yeah. So here's a question. Why would one be delisted? Well, because all the trees will grow in on the summit and the views will go away. Yeah, exactly. So, and that's that's a perfect example with Mount Carr. And also, um, I know um, Sandwich Dome is on the list, but boy, that's that's running out of view fairly quickly. Yeah, it, it definitely is. The... Um, the hike I did up there, I was actually kind of surprised because you, I've done that. I've done the list and I've done a lot of hikes and they're real, really most of the peaks are pretty much wide open views. And I got to sandwich and I actually wasn't sure if I was on the peak because I was like, I can't be on the peak because I had to stand on a rock to actually look to see stuff. But hiking that and combining it with Jennings is is worth, worth the effort. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a number of resources if you're interested in starting with the 52 with a view. So the main resources that I would advise people to check out is there's Ken McGray is an author and a um, 
a local hiker that um, wrote the New Hampshire 52 with a view, a hiker's guidebook. So it's into the second edition. I think he said he's, he's working on the third edition now. So definitely, if you're interested in pursuing these, I would pick that book up. Ken also runs a really uh, a really nice Facebook group called the 52 with a view Facebook group. And uh, it's a really supportive group. Uh, he, <laughs> he runs a bit of a tight ship, so he doesn't put up with any nonsense. So it's really... It's, it's different than a lot of the groups, but he's, you know, it's a supportive group, I guess I would say, more supportive than some of the other Facebook groups that I'm, I'm, I'm involved in. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Stump, do you want to talk a little bit? I, I touched on this a bit, but like the, the geography of the 52 with a view and how it's spread out over New Hampshire versus the 4,000 footer list. Do you want, want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the 52 with a view. These peaks are scattered from top to bottom throughout the state of New Hampshire. The southernmost peak is Mount Monadnock. Most people have heard <laughs> and most people have probably climbed at this point. The northernmost peak is uh, McGalloway. Some of these hikes are much shorter than the 4,000 footers, but don't be surprised if they're not harder. There are a lot of hikes or portions of these hikes that can be extremely challenging and very difficult. The way I look at the 52 with a view list is that there's there's probably, I don't know, 10 to 12 of the, the peaks on the list where they either overlap or they're more difficult than sort of the, the lower to mid tier of the 4,000 footers. And then... You know, there's probably a middle section of the 52 with the views that are as difficult or similar to sort of the lower end of the 4,000 footers. And then there is a group of probably 10 to 15 that are, that are you know, obviously easier than the 4,000 footers. But like Stomp said, the, the geographical spread of these peaks, I mean, you're in the Ossipee Range, which is south of the Sandwich Range. You're in western New Hampshire. You're touching on the Appalachian Trail by going through um, Smarts Mountain and Mount Cube. And then you go into the far north where you're talking about McGalloway and you're talking about um, going to Percy Peaks, which is uh, an amazing hike up in northern New Hampshire. So it gives you a ton of variety. And the way I think of the 52 with the views is that you know, much like the 4,000 footer list gives you a real good feel about the personality of the, the White Mountain National Forest. The 52 with a view list gives you a, a real understanding about all of the peaks and regions of New Hampshire as a whole. So you mentioned some of the regions. The southern New Hampshire region, you have Mount Kearsage, Mount Monadnock primarily. In the lakes region, some of the more popular ones would be Jennings Peak, which you mentioned, Mount Chicora, um, Sandwich Dome. Western New Hampshire, I work over on the western side of the state, over by the Connecticut River, Vermont border. Over there, you have a very popular hike, Black Mountain, which has an amazing view of Musilock, and Mount Cardigan, which is another very busy mountain, but just it's a beautiful hike. And Stinson. Yeah, and that that and that area there is just. I almost hesitate to kind of put it out on the podcast because I want to keep it to myself. But <laughs> uh, you know, between Black Mountain and Benton, Blueberry, uh, Stinson, and um, Cube and and Smarts. I mean, that whole area is just gorgeous, and there's never any crowds there. That's the best thing. Like when we were hiking in, during COVID, it was the best place to go because you never saw anybody around. Yeah, that's a really good point. I you know Black Mountain in particular. That mountain, I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody on that when I've done it. And this is, you know, early afternoon, <laughs> all year round. And it's an amazing mountain. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see anybody else. I think I took a friend up and we, maybe we saw one other group. I think that was about it. But it, and it was on a, a weekend. So mm -hmm. we we had a real good uh, weather day and I was just surprised. But I think what ends up happening is that people that don't know a lot about hiking, they just go to the 4,000 footer list and they do, you know, hikes in the presidential range or somewhere that, you know, is, is better known, you know, maybe they'll hike Mount Major in the, the Belk Naps and, you know, they, they miss out on a lot of the great hikes that are on here. So mm -hmm. I definitely encourage anybody. Matter of fact, I tell people to start with the 52 with a view list. Don't even bother with the 4,000 footers. <laughs> if you're just starting out hiking, do the 52 with a view list. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. Yeah. So where, uh, in your opinion, Stomp, where would you start if you were going to um, start hiking the 52 with a view list? I would pr probably avoid the um, central White Mountains and Crawford Notch area because it does tend to get a little busier. Um, I would go to the, the more distant locations like Mount Kearsage. In the Lakes region, even right here where I live in Thornton, I mean, Jennings 
is an amazing hike, like you mentioned, Mike, and you're not going to see many people up there. Sandwich Dome is a lengthy one, but not not very difficult. Black Mountain, probably a little more difficult. And again, if you're looking for no crowds, that's the place to go, but that can be a little challenging. It's a little steeper. The Sugarloafs would be a fantastic start for a new person on this list, and that's up in Twin Mountain area. Yeah, yeah, and that would be my suggestion too, is the Sugar Sugarloafs would be the first place that I would point people to, or Mount Willard, which is right in Crawford Notch. Yeah. You know, and there's some really tough hikes on on this list. And, you know, the oh, yeah. there's like three or four hikes that are my favorite hikes. Like I think I mentioned in the first episode that the bald face circle is my, you know, my favorite hike in the whites. And I would, I would probably put that as the, the number one recommended hike for me, but it is a difficult hike, probably much more difficult than a lot of 4,000 footers. The other hikes that I would say from a, a challenging perspective and from a view perspective is if you, you the Moat Mountain Traverse, which the, the Moat Range is right uh, outside of North Conway, and that range is just beautiful, and it's a difficult long hike. And then the other one that comes to mind for me is the uh, the Crawford um, Resolution Mount Stairs hike, which is usually you string those three peaks together. Mm-hmm. So and I'm trying to think. I think the only one that me and you have hiked together is the Breaking Trail out to Mount Parker, right? And that well, snowstorm. Actually, there's Mount Martha too. Cherry. Oh, yeah, we did that one, too. Yeah, with uh, Mark uh, Lindenberg. Yeah, that's right. We'll link that in the show notes. We have a video of that one. And that's a beautiful hike as well. Not too challenging. I mean, it gets steep, but it's not a very long trail. And boy, those views are amazing. You know, like I said, the 52 with the view list, I like it a little bit more than the 4,000 footer list. I think I've got 49 of the 52 done, so I'll be finishing up this summer. Uh, I've got to get up to McGalloway, and I've got to get out to the sugar loaf that's up north and then i've got pine mountain and then that's it so that's awesome uh, but we'll put uh, we'll put the link to uh the details about the 52 with a view hiker guidebook and we will put a link to the facebook page as well as a list to the decommissioned peaks i think like i said there's like five or seven of them that are decommissioned right now the way the views kind of just disappeared on them so they, they replace them with with better peaks mm-hmm. and boy uh one of these times we should talk about mount wolf because we had a rescue this last fall, and um, boy, that was rough because it was monsoon rain. That'd be a fun one to cover some night. Yeah, yeah. Is, is Mount Wolf, that's that's the peak that's like sort of behind the Kinsmans in the, in between the Kinsmans and Musalaki. It's, it's like the dead zone, I hear. Uh, everyone that I talk to doesn't like hiking out there. It's a scary place. It, there's a lot of um, deep bogs and sort of old and ratchety bog bridges and if you get stuck out there yeah it's a long long trip out and back but beautiful i mean the kinsmans they have a reputation as being some of the hardest trails in the whites and that certainly that section lives up to it for sure yeah yeah i have a goal of like, i want to i want to complete all the entire appalachian trail in new hampshire probably by the end of the year and i've got to i've got to get out to that section i guess but that's like the one area that i'm looking forward to the least but maybe i'll be wrong i don't know yeah highly recommended cool so do you want to want you want to get into this rescue on the tri-pyramids that uh that you you went out on sure let's do that this was last weekend march 6th up on the tri-pyramids pemi got a call to assist in a rescue of a 69 year old male hiker him and his party had decided to try to make a loop out of the tri-pyramids and their plan was to come up over the tries. I believe they were going up Pine Bend Brook and they were going to the junction of the Kate Sleeper Trail and they were going to go down Downs Brook, if I remember correctly. That was their plan. They were at the top of what they call the South Tri Pyramid Slide and that's a pretty lengthy drop, certainly a couple hundred feet high. And at the moment when they were there, it was windblown and ice covered for much of the outer layer of the snow that was on the the slide. So at the top of the slide, as they were preparing to descend or come up with a plan in terms of how to get down the slide, one member, this fella, slid. He lost his footing and slid about 100 feet and uh, ended up injuring his lower leg. Fun, fun. I know I've been, Yeah. I mean, I've been on the... The north end, the, typically with the tri pyramids in the summer, like there's a there's the north side slide, which is uh, you know this really picturesque steep um, slide, and then you go around sort of the backside, and then the the south slide is more of a scree field, but it's in, in a lot of loose rock. But in mm-hmm. the winter, it's 
I would imagine it's pretty steep. I didn't actually we didn't poke we didn't poke our way down to the salt slide when we did the hike on Friday. But mm -hmm. so that's basically a lot of times people that are going out there, you know, you don't necessarily go to the tri pyramids for like these amazing views or anything like that. You go for the you know the mountaineering experience, and a lot of times people are sort of working on their winter four thousand footer list, and they've got to get out there. So. Most people hit it from the kank uh, from from in the winter versus coming in from Livermore. So what um what, what were you doing when you got the call? I had were you just drinking Pinot or were you? Uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was opening up the second box of Boda Pinot. Oh, nice. <laughs> I had just walked in the door literally from a hike. Uh, I hiked Cone Mountain, which is outside the back here, very close, and it was a nice bushwhack. So I was putting up my wet clothes all around the house, like I do, and uh, boom, the call came in. It had to be just afternoon, like 12.05, like right around 12 o'clock when that call came in. <laughs> Talk about timing. And I usually get the rescue vibe, but I did not have a vibe this time. This one snuck up on me. Now, do you... Um do you ever just bail on it and say, I'm not feeling it, I'm not, I'm not going out? Um, very rarely do I do that. If it comes in, unless there's some major family, you know, thing going on, I'm, I'm going out the door. And I got to be very honest with you on this mission, you, you're aware of my hip issue with the arthritis and stuff like that. I'm not sure if yeah. I've mentioned it on the episodes much, but, uh, I'm looking I mean, at I've definitely mentioned that you're old, yeah. so <laughs> people aren't going to be surprised. A uh, brittle, I think brittle's better. Brittle's okay. yeah, right. brittle. But uh, yeah, so I'm facing some work on my hip soon. And uh, the good news is that's coming right around the corner. So after doing a hike, I have a very limited gas tank in terms of what I can pull off. And when this one came in, I scratched my head and I really doubted myself as to whether or not I would want to be involved with it. So what's neat is we have a new dispatch system for the team. It's called Active 911. And it's the latest and the greatest for dispatch apps on your phone and you know when an alert comes out boom you get it instantaneously it has a chat feature it shows you actually who's responding who can't make it who's waiting to watch to see what happens people are chiming in on the chat and there were a few members that actually usually always show up that you know if they show up then they may necessarily not need my help if i you know that type of thing so i realized that these people weren't showing up and i had absolutely no choice i had to go got it and how many people typically will show up at a search well or there, rescue there, the average is about 13 to 20 and that depends upon season you know weekend versus weekday that type of thing it was early in the day. Now, that's usually a big problem for volunteer groups because volunteers are usually avid hikers. So that happened in this case. We only had five people that could respond to this, which is pretty low for PEMI. And it's, you know, it's in the winter, you can get away with fewer people because the, the devices that we use to carry people move a lot easier in the winter. Um, yeah. In the right conditions. In the summer, you need at least 18 plus people to carry somebody down a Rocky Mountain uh, trail. So that's interesting. So if I'm, if, if I'm going to get injured on a hike, then it sounds like I'd, I'm better off getting injured like late in the day. You guys will get there quicker than if it's middle of the day. You're all out there hiking and doing cool stuff. Yes, this this should be part of the uh, the hike safe mantra. Yes, right, hike right, later, right, so. wake up later. <laughs> well, Mike. It, actually, that's that's sort of a telltale sign. Like a lot of people that start late end up getting in trouble because they don't know any better, and they're like, I I, I didn't know I needed a, a headlamp even though the sun disappeared on me. Well, you know, we we call the five o'clock hour the witching hour because that's when these things usually come in. Yeah, this yeah, yeah. in this case, this was much earlier because these people were halfway through their hike. And it was a fluke. It was a mechanical fluke. And it wasn't, it wasn't due to fatigue necessarily. That's what we see a lot. Later in the day, it's getting dark. You step wrong. You're tired. You're lazy. You, you can break a bone real easy. Uh, midday rescues are a lot less common. They're always later afternoon or, you know, in that time frame. Got it. And then so you get the call. You know you're going because you, we need content for the uh, the podcast anyway. So you got to get out there. for You're not allowed to say no anymore. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> where Who decides where you guys stage and you you, you, you meet to, to start the search? That is a decision made by Fish and Game. In this case, their strategy was to meet at the Livermore Tripoli Road Junction 
Tripoli Road is so for, is closed right now. So people that aren't familiar, it's basically like Waterville Valley ski area. Right, right? exactly. And their plan right off the bat was to, to, to shuttle us in by snowmobile and then to have us hike the rest of the way to these people. Very cool. Have you ever ridden a snowmobile before? I have. This is really brief, but it's interesting. There was a hiker in a blizzard that made it to Zealand Hut. So Zealand Road is closed. That's three, three to five miles long. I think at least three. Yeah. Yeah, it's about three and a half, I think. Yeah. So this fellow was at the hut. And he was climbing down a bunk, and he slipped. So we had to shuttle by snowmobile and other means to Zealand Road and then hike in to the hut, which was another three miles or so. All right. So this was like a similar scenario to that. So you guys met at yeah, similar. in Livermore, and then they the fishing game, they just bring the, the snowmobiles on a trailer and get it ready to go? Yes. In this case, I showed up first. And me being the first person for PEMI, I was the staging officer. So I'm responsible for, you know, checking all the people in, making sure they're prepared, not sick, not intoxicated, things of that nature. And in this case, um, we waited a good hour before the first PEMI member showed up. Because again, in the winter, it's real easy to be the next victim if you're not prepared. Fortunately for these people, they were well prepared and they could sit and wait for us for a while. That's the one blessing of this rescue. These people were extremely prepared. They each had crampons. They had the um, ice axes. They had multiple sleeping bags. So despite the fact that this person was injured and had a weight, they were warm and they could weather it, which is fantastic. Unlike, you know, recent rescues in probably the last several weeks, uh, people weren't prepared and they were had severe hypothermia. So it's very important to be ready in the winter. And we'll talk about a little bit more about the background of these people because they actually, you know, it's sort of like the search and rescue dream yeah. scenario where the, these were AMC certified like hike leaders and they had basically everything. So I, I'll, I'm going to pull a little bit of a quote off of Instagram from one of the people that was involved in the party that, that talks a little bit about behind the scenes from their perspective. But so anyway, you you guys meet at Livermore, you're going in on the snow machines. Uh, how, how, how does that work? You basically just hop on a machine and then they take a couple of you there they needed six members to participate in this and we we provided that after a few redundant calls we sent out another call just to see if anybody was available because again it was slim pickings at the time three officers showed up with their sleds and the idea was to take two out at a time and the first shuttle left around 251 or so in that neighborhood so it took a while for everybody to get there and get prepared and get on the on the way. This hiker was 4.6 miles from the trailhead. The rescue teams were able to take the snowmobiles 2.6 miles up Livermore Road, where they came to the junction um, of basically an unbroken trail with knee-deep snow, and that was another 2.3 miles to get to the victim. Yeah, so you've got to basically, so you get, so for people that aren't familiar, Livermore is basically a road. So like when you hike it in the summertime, you'll see like um, mountain bikers go through there. It's cross country skiers go go along that area there. So it's pretty much a flat area, which is so it's perfect for snowmobiles. The problem is, is that when you need to get to the bottom of the south side slide, it's a, it's a narrow trail. There's a water crossing in the beginning, and it, it's very rarely traveled. So you're talking about breaking trail. So when we say breaking trail, that basically means that everybody's putting on snowshoes and you're cutting through solid crust on the top of the snow and making a trail so that you can, you know, the people behind you have an easier time to, to go through. So anytime there's fresh snow, we always talk about like, we got to go out and break trails. So you've got what, six of you that are basically busting through to, to, to get a trail going for the, the rescue. Yep. That's right. Yeah. One of the um, fishing game officers was actually able to push his snowmobile point two further onto Slide Brook Trail past the junction of Livermore. But it just, like you said, it just got too narrow and too deep. So they, they wouldn't even be able to turn the uh, snowmobile around if they had to. So point two out, that's where everybody started breaking trail. Now, do you do you immediately claim that you're old and your hips injured and you need to be the last person behind everybody so that you have a nice clean trail to walk on? Well, just to clarify, I arrived first and then Jim Neeland put me in charge at command. But he also went out there to meet the groomer that Waterville Valley provided for us for the mission, which is fantastic. So 
Yeah, it was neat. That was the first time I'd really been locked into the command uh, center role, which is pretty cool. And it's nice for old. Oh, that's the that's totally the move. You get to be in the middle of everything, but you don't actually have to do any hard work by breaking yeah, trail or doing anything like that. It's the old farts dream. It's just, yeah, it's fantastic. Exactly, exactly. That's the benefits of being old. <laughs> so I'm not going to so. toot my horn here and say I was like out there. I wanted to be out there, but I was shifted and rerouted to a different role, which is pretty cool. Nice, nice. Well, I mean, I'll I'll let you do it this one time, but if, if all of a sudden you become like the I'm sitting in the parking lot guy, like I got to find a new co-host because I, I, I need you out in the action, man. Um, That's great. So what about how did Waterville Valley get involved? Like who, who calls them and says, I need a snow groomer? Basically, we were getting report from the officers on the field that the patient was extremely uncomfortable and in severe pain. And the, the reality about snowmobiles, when you're riding a snowmobile, it is a bumpy ride. So they made the decision that it would be best if they could get a more smooth, uh, stable machine to get out there. So Jim made a call and um, Waterville was able to provide or redirect actually because they, they were out grooming trails already. So they redirected one of their groomers back to the Livermore trailhead. It was interesting. I was there alone just you know, with my radio, checking things out. And this thing comes, <laughs> it was like a mechanized robot, one mile an hour. I'm looking at it coming up into the trailhead, thinking to myself, if that's as slow as it goes, we're going to be here till sunrise. The driver said, oh yeah, I'll be there in about half an hour, which actually wasn't too bad. I mean, that's about average. I think when we were shuttling people, it was taking about, you know, 25 minutes round trip to get out to the junction of Slidebrook and then back. So 30 minutes isn't too bad. Yeah. And I think for the listeners, like this is a very common thing. Um, like I've seen this with the first time I've heard about Waterville using a snow groomer to help out. But like you hear about this, like the Cog Railroad in, on Mount Washington, like they'll mobilize to help rescue hikers if they get in trouble. Uh, the Cannon Mountain Tram is always utilized in rescues. Um people step in but it's it's not uncommon at all for these different oh the the other thing that comes to mind is the amc hot crew members they'll step in and basically help out with rescues whenever they're they're needed so there's a whole infrastructure within the the hiking and, and mountaineering community where you guys can rely on you know help from from a variety of different areas everybody sort of rolls their sleeves up and and, and helps out when needed yes and we do have a special breakout uh, podcast specifically regarding the structure of search and rescue in New Hampshire. And I highly recommend people look at that and take a listen because it's really fascinating. And there's a lot of levels to search and rescue, a lot of um, aspects and different, different groups for different reasons and purposes. And it's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. And so, Stomp, one thing I, I want to get into here is the, the nice thing about this particular rescue, like I said, is the, the mem their, their AMC hike leaders that were out on this hike and they one of the guys that was involved not the victim himself but his friend basically posted a long summary of the events that they dealt with on instagram I, so i saw that he, it's pretty cool yeah yeah so just a quick rundown basically they were like you said they were doing a tri pyramids white face pass a conway loop they got to the salt slide i guess they had some issues where the snow went from soft and stable to to hard packed with a with a sheer with a layer on top and the victim, basically, he was wearing snowshoes. He was adjusting his position. And basically, like, it was so frozen over that he just slid down 100 feet or so, like you said. Uh, his two friends had ice axes. They switched over to crampons, got down there, checked on him. He was basically like, I can't bear any weight on this. They called 911. And basically, their decision was that they needed to get to the bottom of this slide and then they were going to hunker down for a rescue. So uh, this slide, I'll post some pictures on the show notes uh, to, to show this slide, but it's a big wide open slide. I mean, it's when you think of, you know, a crazy sledding hill, this would be exactly what you would think of, but steeper. And uh, they made it to the bottom. And a lot of times I think in these injuries, like you want to keep the victim moving because they've got adrenaline pumping and, you know, maybe the pain isn't as bad, but basically they got him down by putting on crampons and then kick stepping into the slide so that this the, the the injured party could basically follow and there was steps 
built into the the slide for them to get to the bottom of it. And then I think once they got to the bottom, they had sleeping bags, they had um, inflatable pad that they could put him in and they just basically bundled them in to a sleeping bag and waited for the the cavalry to show up yeah basically um 4 30 the first premier member arrived at the victim and what happens then they just generally start packaging sounds sort of crude but they're putting the person into either a litter or a sked and that's s-k-e-d started out as a military method of transporting injured patients on the field. We have one and uh, we generally only use it for body recoveries year round or in particular a rescue in the winter because it moves like a bullet and in the right kind of terrain, it's a very fast way to get somebody out. One person could carry a 200 pound person uphill without any effort. It's just amazing the leverage that this thing gives you. So, this person was being packaged around 4.30. They start moving downhill around 5.30. At about 5.35, that's when the Waterville groomer left the trailhead, um, estimating at a you know, 30-minute arrival time to get to the victim. So later, they all arrive back at the trailhead at, at about 7.20 p.m. And according to the report, they, they declined um, an ambulance. You know, the victim's family took them straight away to definitive care down towards the lake region. Great, yeah. And I think we'll have, we'll, I mean, we've already talked about this with, you know, like that case on Franconia Ridge with the runners. Like that was a textbook example of what not to do. Uh, this is a sort of a textbook example of being prepared. I mean, realistically, the, the way I term this is that shit happens. Sometimes, you know, you twist an ankle, you slip and fall, you're injured. You got to call 911 because you can't put your, your hiking partners or yourself at risk. And this group had everything that they needed in order to bundle the, the victim up, keep him warm and survive. I mean, it sounds like they could have survived easily for the night if they needed to. And they got him to a place that was accessible to the rescue team really realistically like if they had decided to wait at the top of the slide you're talking about almost an impossible feat to get him down that slide without him doing it on his own so i think they made the right call every step of the way in this one hmm. yeah and it, here's an interesting little side note too slide brook trail is really fairly gentle if you've been on it it's um, a very easy grade until you get to the base of the slide from the junction of livermore road to the patient, that's about 2.3 miles. It took the team an hour and a half to get to that person in deep snow, breaking trail. Not too shabby. You know, that's, that's, no, not, not I bad mean, at all. another thing you have to think about every member, including fishing game, they're mandated. They have to carry about 70 pounds of gear. So our members are a little less regimented in terms of what they have to carry. They have to be self sufficient. It's their call. Fishing game, on the other hand, they have to carry everything it's you know it's protocol so they're you're talking 50 to 70 pounds on the backs of everybody walking out there and they made it out in an hour and a half on the way back with the sked just to give you a sense of how fast that thing moves and you're going downhill of course they got out in about 60 65 minutes so they shaved off yeah, close yeah, to half an hour yeah, and it's a big difference in the in the winter with the snow versus having to carry somebody in the in the the summer because, like you said, like you can really just drag somebody along in those that sked. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't state enough how critical it was for that hiking party to be able to get him down to the bottom of the slide because otherwise, you know, you're talking all night. And in my opinion. If they had stalled higher up on the slide, that's a whole different ballgame because now you're talking belays, and which we can do, but not to the extent that would have been needed to get that guy safely down an ice-covered slide. Pemi just does not generally do that. Yeah, and those slides, like I was there the day before, and I was on the north side slide, which is a steeper, wider slide. And me and George, my, my new hiking friend, we actually went down a little ways to sort of just poke out there to see if we could get a view. And... The snow, like we were able to break trail in our snowshoes for a little bit, but what ends up happening is like nobody travels those slides and over time they get wind beaten and they just turn to a sheet of ice. Like I couldn't even break trail 
on that on that snow, I would have had to ch- change over to crampons and come down. And it sounds like they just went a little bit too far. But like you said, like it, it would have been a completely different scenario if they they hadn't been able to descend the slide on their own. So right. big thumbs up to this this crew. They really. Um, even though shit happens and you you, know, you have an injury, like they really did everything they could to optimize the 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 outcome in a positive way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure, absolutely, and they were very grateful. All right, well, I think this this is a wrap here. So no more clipboard duty for you, though. You got to get out there next time. <laughs> ah, the big cheese. I, I like the big cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, that's good. That's very good. And there was no North. There was no Northwoods Law on this one, right? And no, I have not seen those guys for quite quite some time. But um, yeah, yeah. Once my hips better, I'll be out there crushing it. Very good. So I think our next topic here. So um, uh, the next one's it's hiking drama, high drama on the in the hiking groups here. So there was um, a a big blow up in the hiking community on you know the Facebook groups and. It, it's around, we talked about the gamification of hiking last week around how we do these like 4,000 footer list and the 52 with a view list and peak bagging. And there's the this idea of the grid, which is hiking all the 4,000 footers over the course of, uh, or in every month of the year. So as these hiking games were being created, there was one game that was created, which is called the, the White Mountain Guide Redlining activity and the idea is that you hike every trail in the white mountain guide and you know the term redlining basically comes from this idea that you you mark your completed hikes on a map with a red pen so that basically the redlining has been around for i, I don't even know how long for like 20 30 years it's it's a controversial term which uh, i'll talk about a little bit in a in a moment but um, just to set the table here there's a number of groups. So we talked about the over the hill hiker gang that oversees the 52 with a view list. Anytime we're talking about a list or an activity, there's a governing body that oversees all of these different games. So from the perspective of the redlining activity, the what we call the grid advisory council or the grid trust is the the organization that oversees the the redlining group and they have a redlining facebook group that uh, basically people just kind of get together and talk about trails and the 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 challenge with redlining is that there's so many obscure little trails and spurs that you've got to figure out how to get to that and a lot of people aren't into it so you're talking maybe i don't know stop what would you think there's probably at any one point in time maybe a hundred people tops that are actually seriously pursuing a red line in the white mountains oh yeah if that yeah yeah, I would say. Yeah, I, it's a very, very select niche. Yeah, and it's mostly people that are locals. You know, they're able to hike during the week, and you know, they just decide to dedicate themselves to doing it. Most of the time, it's like scenarios where people tally it up and say, well, like, I'm already 70% there. I might as well just finish the rat last bit, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so basically, the grid council oversees this, and it's this is not like an organized grid. This is like four or five people that are involved in, you know, giving out patches that when people complete it so it's it's done on the honor system and uh, you know you basically just notify the grid council when you've completed your red line they'll add your name to a list and i don't even know if there's a patch i'm sure they give out a patch we give out patches for everything they associated with anything that amc is doing with the 48 4000 footers different group totally different different groups so okay yeah so they there's the amc 4000 footer group that oversees the 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 48 4,000 footers. Then there's the grid trust, which oversees the gridding and redlining designation. See, I did not know that. That's I'm so glad I listened to this podcast. Yeah, yeah. So, and again, it's it's basically like a group of a it's a very small group, and then they have a Facebook group that's called uh, White Mountain Redlining. So, where the controversy erupts is that basically the the redlining Facebook group and the grid council received an email from an organization that is overseen by a blogger. This blogger, the, the blog name is called Finding Philip, And this particular blog is overseen by um, an ultra marathoner, ultra runner, ultra hiker, who currently owns the the fastest time of completing the grid. And then he is claiming the fastest time of completing the the red line so he's a little bit of a a minor celebrity and he's got you know a small group of people that basically got together with him so the finding philip group 
apparently notified the Grid Trust and uh, the the redlining Facebook group that they were concerned around the word redlining. And you know, if you ask me, you know, two three weeks ago, you know, hey, if you could do a small gesture to ensure that the 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 outdoor community was more inclusive, I would have said, yeah, I'll do whatever it takes. You know, I, I'm I'm a big supporter of that idea, and any gesture that we can do to make the outdoor community more inclusive, I would absolutely jump on. And then this controversy comes around, and I'm like, now I'm rethinking the whole thing because it's this is really one of these scenarios where it's like a small gesture to enhance inclusiveness came with a whole bunch of unintended consequences. And I think that everybody that was involved in this controversy sort of came out of this with uh, an education in, you know, how to better communicate and, you know, really, I think probably is looking at it from the perspective of next time we have to have these discussions, is there a better way to go about it? So I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. How does this Phillips group have time to send out emails <laughs> yeah i mean i, I don't know I, I think that basically aren't they on the mountain all the yeah, time i know well i think that they're <laughs> you know to their credit you know they've got a number of different initiatives that they're doing around um expanding access to the outdoors to underrepresented populations which is an absolutely noble cause that i'm 100 percent supportive of the challenge here is that um you know, their position is that the word redlining has racist connotations because if you go back into the, like the 20s and 30s, basically redlining was an activity that the financial system would utilize to map out areas that they would not allow bank loans or access to housing for underrepresented populations, particularly black um, residents of cities. So redlining has a horrible history of sort of prohibiting uh, economic growth and success within the the African-American community. So the point of the Finding Philip group was that we don't like the use of that term. It's not welcoming. And, you know, they've gotten feedback from people of color that they don't feel like that's an appropriate term to use for the activity that, you know, of, of hiking all the, all the trails in the White Mountains. So what happened was there was a communication that went out, I think it was on like a Friday night or Friday morning that said, you know, if the Finding Philip group sent a note to the, the grid trust to say that, you know, here's our, here's our request. We want you to change the, uh, the name of this. And, you know, we're going to be sending out a blog post on Tuesday morning and a petition to, to make sure that it's, uh, you know, that it's, it's really a, something we're going to, we're going to get behind. So you know, what ended up happening is that there was a post by the administrator on the redlining group that basically just laid it out and said, look, there's some concerns about this word. I want to open up debate to the group. So let's talk about it. And basically what what happened was, is people came down into sort of three, three camps, three distinct camps of opinions here. There was people who immediately got behind it and said, look, it's an easy gesture. Happy to do it. Uh, I'm supportive of the change. Let's do it. All right. There was other people that pointed out that words have multiple meanings and that there was never any ill intent with the creation of, of this course. game and the naming. So so let's take let's take the word back and you know let's not cancel this word because it, it has multiple meanings. And then there was a third group that was sort of ambivalent or resistant about, you know, where does this end? And you know, now that they're gonna they're gonna cancel redlining, they're gonna cancel some other other names. Like Mount Washington is the one that probably comes to mind the most because there's a Native American name. I, I can't remember the name of the Mount Washington. Ajia Kachuk. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. like, where does it end? And it was interesting because the the head of the sort of Finding Philip group came on and his immediate reaction to anybody that sort of was in the, the second or the third camp was that sort of like, you're showing your white supremacy and you're sort of um, showing your privilege. And it was, uh, it was, it was pretty confrontational. So I think a lot of people <laughs> just got really uncomfortable because they're sort of in this situation to say like, let's debate it, let's talk about it. And, you know, the, it basically ended up becoming this situation where it was like, you know, we don't want to talk about it. We're just going to, you're either going to accept it or you're going to be labeled a racist, which, you know, I, I don't know how productive that is at the end, end of the end of the day. So it became sort of a long debate uh, that went back and forth. And, um, 
you know, there was a number of people that were pretty vocal about the need to change this. And uh, ultimately, what it ended up happening is that this request or the discussion was taken up by the Grid Trust, who made the decision to rename the group to the the hiking and tracing the the White Mountain Trails group. So moving forward, we will no longer be referencing redlining, or at least I won't be. Uh, we'll be talking about hiking and tracing the the White Mountain Guide or White, White Mountain Trail. So they renamed it, uh, and primarily the reason I think that they renamed it was that they just felt like you know it's it's a small gesture. You know we're not in a position to really uh, want to handle any kind of controversy, and you know for us it's just a fun game. There's such a, it's such a niche thing. Like let's just change the name. I guess the unfortunate thing about that was that prior to the grid council changing the name, there was a, a, you know, the post went out on Tuesday morning, there was a petition, and then there was a number, I think there was at least one Instagram post from one of the organizers that uh, was pretty rough on the administrator of the red line group to the point where, you know, it, it, they she had to issue a retraction afterwards. So, um Ultimately, I think that, you know, when the dust settled on this whole thing, the name was changed. There was a healthy debate around it. And, you know, ultimately, you know, the, the organizers of the, the group that was trying to change it, I think what they, they basically realized was they came out and sort of issued an apology and said, you know, look, we want to be, we want to push change and we want to create an environment where we're opening out the outdoor opening up the outdoors to underrepresented populations but we want to do it in a way that's more inclusive you know for me the fear that i have when i see things like this is that you know when you're talking about diversity and inclusion initiatives and trying to drive participation like you really need to have programs that involve sort of measurable impacts you know these symbolic small gestures going towards such a niche thing i don't know how much they actually help and i actually wonder whether or not they might turn off people that would otherwise be supportive and allies so oh no question i'd be really surprised if they continue with this um, sudden reasonable approach. I really do. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, from my perspective, I'm always, I always take the view that, you know, th- I absolutely, uh, I absolutely acknowledge that the, uh, the outdoor community is primarily sort of a white community You know, where we live in New Hampshire is not a very diverse community. So any activity that we can take to open out the, open up the outdoors to underrepresented populations, I'm all for, but like I said, you know, I want want to be involved in things that will make uh, sort of measurable and impactful change. The the idea that you're going to take a stand on something that's so niche that has very little impact and like I said could result in you know, sort of distrust or, you know, hesitancy to, to get involved in otherwise noble causes is is something that I think, and, and the group sort of set out, let out an apology. And the, the thing that stood to my mind and is that they they want to be a, uh, a a call in culture and not a call out culture. So I think that there was a lot of learning that happened from this, and it's it may be a good thing that it actually happened. It's such a niche situation that doesn't have a lot of impact one way or the other because people will learn from this, and you know we'll see what what the genesis of the sort of results of this are and I'm, I'm hoping that this group will sort of take the learning experience from this and, and direct their energies towards really like i said impactful events versus just looking at you know trying to trying to get rid of a single word here mm. yeah good luck with that <laughs> yeah yeah so so we'll see and, and the other thing that's the 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 other very interesting thing about this that uh, I'm very, I've been involved and very interested in over the the last few years is that there was sort of a sidebar controversy that developed over this, which is that um, the the head of this organization that was pushing for the elimination of red line is like I said, he's the uh, he's the he's holds the fastest time to complete the grid, and he also is claiming the fastest time to complete the uh, hiking and tracing the White Mountain Guide. The problem with that is that it's it's 
the the fastest known time again we talk about sort of these governing um, agencies that oversee these things the fastest known time is actually overseen by a separate group that has a different set of rules so the the head of this organization again his name is Philip Carcia and you know he's well known around the hiking communities on a lot of podcasts and he basically a lot of what he derives his sort of living on is being a a, a speed hiker. So um, you know he's a public figure from that perspective, and he you know he announced in June of last year that he was going to be attempting the fastest known time for at the time the Red Line and now known as the uh, the Hiking and Tracing the White Mountain Guide. And you know there's been a number of people that have looked at. Um, this situation and they've asked a number of questions around, you know, has he really, you know, completed this entire um, hike? So the goal is to hike the, all of the trails in the, the white mountain guide. He um, started the, the push to try to do this in a single season in June of 2020. And he completed the event in 99 days. So he basically hiked uh, according to him, 1,950 miles, uh, 652 trails of the white mountain guide. And the previous record was 173 days. And you know, when he made the announcement, he he put it on Strava. He basically said he was going to be tracking his miles on Strava, that he would be um, attempting an FKT. And he called out the, the person that currently holds the fastest known time who was who posted on the, the FKT website. And, you know, he he completed it in 99 days and he's been marketing himself as the, the fastest known time holder for probably the last six months or so. The problem is, is that he does not have... Um, the designation on the FKT site. So it would be like, Stomp, it would be like basically like you claiming that you're the world record holder, the Guinness Book of World Record holder in the mile. Mm -hmm. But you've never actually submitted to the Guinness Book of World Records. Right, so something's a mess. Yeah, exactly. So basically when you look at his GPS data that he had said that he was going to be saving on Strava, like it just doesn't match up. Like there's about 300 miles that are missing and I have no doubt that this guy's out there grinding and hiking. Mm -hmm. What I do question is whether or not he was actually getting all of the spurs that he needed to do because the, 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 the White Mountain Guide tracing exercise is really a logistic issue. And you've got to be on the ball when it comes to the logistics to make sure that you hit all those spur trails. So yeah. there was a number of people because of the redlining controversy that then called out Philip around whether or not he actually had completed the the FKT as he claimed because he never submitted with the FKT site. That site does confirm GPS data. And Philip has since removed all references from him holding the fastest known time from his um, social media byline. So I don't really know what to think. Mm. It could be that he's just getting his information together to submit to the fastest known time site. But his reaction when being called out was basically to sort of turn it back around on the accusers and say, like, I know what I did. I don't have to prove anything. But you're marketing yourself as the fastest known time holder, which is governed by the FKT site that requires you to validate your activity using GPS, and he has yet to do so six months after completing it. So mm -hmm. a little bit of a spinoff current controversy that I found interesting. If I were the celebrity <laughs> getting all these uh, accolades and whatnot, I'm sure I'd get my info in pretty quick if I had it that weekend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we'll see. I mean, I'll, I'll keep it updated, but um, you know, his response was that, well, I, I guess he wants to do it again. So he said, I'm going to redo it in 2021 to, to try to do it in a single season. So he wants to get it down to 90 days. So um, like I said, it's a logistical nightmare to figure mm -hmm. out how to get to all these, all these trails. And it's very easy to miss something. And if you're not uh, organized or you're not tracking things and you let it go too far, then it's easy to slip up. And that, mm -hmm. that could be what happened here. I mm -hmm. don't really know. So anyway, a lot of drama in the hiking community this week. <laughs> so yeah, so I think um, that's that's pretty much it for this show. So I, I'd say, you know, thanks for listening. And if you've enjoyed the show, please follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, if you want to learn more about the 52 with a view list or the search and rescue events that we discussed, we'll add the, the, those details to the show notes on the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue Call show pages, which can be found on Facebook and Instagram. 
And we look forward to to you joining us next week as we discuss the Terrifying 25 list. Uh, So until next time, I'm Mike. And I'm Stomp. Get out there and crush some peaks. Now covered in scratches, blisters, and bug bites, Chris Staff wanted to complete his most challenging day hike ever. Fish and game officers say the hiker from Florida activated an emergency beacon yesterday morning. He was hiking along the Appalachian Trail when the weather started to get worse. Officials say the snow was piled up to three feet in some spots and there was a wind chill of minus one degree. And there's three words to describe this race. Do we all know what they are? Only one hill! Here's Lieutenant James Nealon, New Hampshire Fish and Game. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. What are some of the most common mistakes you see people make when they're heading out on the trails to hike here in New Hampshire? It seems to me the most common is being unprepared, and I think if they just simply visited uh, hikesafe.com and got a list of the 10 essential items and had those in their packs, they probably would have no need to ever call us at all.